scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. It's an honor to speak in this conference and I pray that your word will come with power. Bless our hearts and let Jesus be glorified. In Jesus' name, God bless you and thank you. Please be seated. It truly is my joy and my honor to bring the word of the Lord even tonight and I appreciate this opportunity. I do not take it for granted. Praise the name of the Lord. It's going to be a very brief session and I trust that the Lord will grant us understanding. Conferences like this, as I would always say, is an opportunity to encounter the word of God the boundary of God's commitment to a believer is his word the word of God defines the boundaries God is not mandated to commit himself outside of the jurisdiction of the word of God the word of God defines the boundaries so every need that the word of God does not create space for cannot be met the Bible says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Hallelujah. We live in very challenging times as again has been observed on this altar. But more than that, I think that the men are being more challenged than we realize. And in fact, one of the ways that God judges a territory is by withdrawing men and what they represent. That when God wants to judge a territory, please give us Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. Let's just look at the first four verses and then I'll just build from there. Isaiah chapter 3. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stock okay from hence if we can just have King James just KJV thank you very much thank you very much it says the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water so this is judgment happening next verse verse 2 what does he withdraw the mighty man and the man of war the judge and the prophet now look at the caliber of people he's withdrawing what then is left of his society when all these men are gone the mighty man the man of war the judge the prophet the prudent and the ancient verse 3 the captain of 50 and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artifice and the eloquent orator verse 4 look at what is left of any society that does not have men and i will give children to be their princes and babes to rule over them someone say god forbid speak to us O god in the name of jesus christ Believers have been given a mandate and I think that for a very long time 
the whole idea of God's agenda is, is, is a concept that I would respectfully observe has not been thoroughly understood in the body of Christ generally. We have pockets of ideas as to what God has done or what he desires from men. If you ask at random, you pick any believer who has been very faithful in church and you ask him, what does God really want? He would give you ideas like he wants souls saved. Others will say he wants people blessed. Others will say he wants people to prosper. But if we are unable to understand God's mind and the full, the, the full scope of God's idea and God's expectation, we will continue to shadow box around the things of the kingdom in hope that what we are doing is satisfying the heart of God. But the Bible does not leave the will of God and his intention as a mystery. Praise the Lord. The Bible lets us know in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 11, Jesus was having one of his mentorship sessions with the disciples and he says, it has been given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. So it is not hidden. He desires that we have that understanding, that we can live our lives with intention and with accuracy, knowing that I am living my life satisfying the desire of the Father, not guessing, not hoping, not wishing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, let me start tonight by saying that believers are called many things in Scripture. Theologically speaking, Believers are named and classified uh, by a twofold uh, index. Number one, believers are named according to our identity. It's, it's a system of identification with Christ. That means that the Bible describes believers with respect to their identity. So names like um, you are the sons of God. Names like branch names like joint heirs these these are all names descriptions of believers that attempts to show them the depth of their connection are we together now so the first naming of believers is according to their identification the goal is to help you see and and conceive as a reality the depth of your oneness with the christ but the second system of naming is according to function and assignment so believers are also called kings and priests believers are called light and salt believers are called ambassadors believers are called witnesses this description does not just attempt to show our identity it is a revelation of the responsibility dimension hallelujah if all believers know is that i am one with christ i am a joint heir as 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 powerful as that is it does not create the balance we have to understand that there are names that activate that sense of responsibility hallelujah in first peter chapter 2 and verse 9 i'll run through some scriptures we may not have the luxury of projecting all of them because of time you may do well to just scrabble them down i apologize if i run faster than you're writing praise the lord first peter 2 and verse 9 the bible observes there that we are a the bible says we are a chosen generation it calls us a royal priesthood a royal priesthood a holy nation a peculiar people and then the bible says we are mandated to show forth the praises to show forth the praises is the word doxazo to make manifest that which brings glory to the king to show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light daniel chapter 7 please and verse 27 just running to a, school, a few scriptures that, that lets us know that believers are not just roaming around the earth. God did not just make man, uh, gave him authority and just allowed him to do what he, whatever he has to do. No, there, there is a description, there is a definition. Are we together? The Bible says, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him 
this is a very clear description that a time will come creation regardless of the pride of mankind something will bring man to his knees and he will acknowledge that there is a god in heaven and that there are individuals who have been mandated to cooperate with the holy spirit to make this a reality are we together psalms 8 this was the contemplation of the psalmist psalm 8 for the sake of time let's go to verse 4 the psalmist began to wonder why god was so interested in man he was a very, very wise person. And on the strength of the manifestation of that grace upon his life, he was just contemplating. Why would God not replace man and create another species of humanoids? What, 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 what was in man that would make God to chase man? He would rebel against God and they would be given to their enemies. And none of them would come to say, God, I'm sorry. And yet God in his own act, he would send a prophet to now call them and say, look, let's talk again. God did not hide his vulnerability towards man in scripture. And so the psalmist contemplating on this now began to write. He said, what is man? I wish we had the time when you read the previous verses, you say, when I consider the lilies and this and that and that, he now came to the conclusion that what is man? Just give us from verse 4. That thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him. Verse 5. He says, thou hast made him lower than the angels. The word there is Elohim. Thou hast made him lower than God. Not just Angelios, the beings. You have made him just a little lower than God. Then you have crowned him with glory and honor. The next verse. He says, thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put how many things? All things under his feet genesis chapter 1 last verse and then we we'll begin to build from there from verse 26 this was the account of the creation or what we would call theologically speaking the recreation of the earth after the flood that brought judgment in genesis 1 and verse 2 the bible says from verse 3 and god said light be and he saw that it was good then he began to bring forth other things when we get to verse 26 the bible says and elohim and god said let us make man in our own image now look at the formation of man it's amazing how the bible is very meticulous it, it tells you what was in the mind of god in the making of man praise the lord I'm glad that this, this church, this church is, is quite, quite a plethora of absolutely brilliant people. When I was hearing the names, I mean, I was wondering, I said, my God, what a church. When you have a church with so much uh, intellectual resource, I think it's, it's a great advantage. And so I believe that we're not in ignorance as to um, when, when, when the details in a product is described, is so that you can appreciate the product. Praise the Lord. When you take a very quality product, you turn to the back of your casing, your wrap, they would go and give you details. It contains vitamins, it contains this. In fact, this has already provided X amount of your recommended daily allowance. So God is not just saying, let's make man. He wants you to appreciate what went into the making of man. Are we together now? so he says let us make man but let us make him after our image now theologically speaking and i hope I, this does not create any kind of um, debate and all of that but we know that adam was not the first man adam was the first man created in the image and the likeness of god both bible and science agree to the fact that there had been an existence of humanoid species the Bible tells us that even the first occupant of the Garden of Eden was not Adam himself. It was Lucifer, the son of the morning. Thou was in Eden, the Garden of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, I'm saying that so that we'll understand this. When, when Lucifer was cast down and there was the judgment that was in Genesis 1 verse 2. When God was making man... Lucifer was somewhere in the horizon watching what was happening. Don't you think it was only God and dust? 
there was an audience watching the creativity of Elohim, giving to man what made Lucifer. This was what Lucifer wanted. This was the exact reason for the rebellion in heaven. So when God casted Lucifer down so that he does not look like an insecure God, he said, what I'm dealing with is rebellion. I'm secured enough to give all of me into an entity. Remember that the goal of Satan was to create a parallel government so that you could honor either God or him. That was his offense. He did not want to replace God. He wanted to be an option to God. So when he was judged down, now God, he watched the artistry of God, breathing his own life. Let us make man in our image. What is image? Our character. And then our likeness, our functionality. So let us make man in our character and let us make man to function like us. Are we still together? It says, and this pishi of being, whoever it is that emerges from this world, that man, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air. These are different jurisdictions. Are we together now? The sea, the air, and over the cattle and the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 27. So, God created man in his own image in the image of god created him male and female created he them 28 hallelujah and god blessed them and said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea the fowl of the air every living thing that moves upon the earth so we know that man is the zenith of God's creation. The symbol of his artistry is man. Our corporate mandate, therefore, let me read something I just wrote here very quickly. Our corporate mandate is twofold. It's important as believers that we understand that we have a corporate mandate given to every believer regardless of the geography of your assignment it does not matter whether you are a preacher whether you are a career person whether it's in family we have a corporate mandate and the corporate mandate is twofold number one the first of it is to establish the lordship of jesus christ in the hearts of men this is the first mandate everyone is given this mandate that for as long as you have the privilege of breath in your nostrils, there is an expectation from God towards you that you become a contributor to seeing that the Lordship of the Christ be established in the hearts of men. And the spiritual strategy that the Bible uses to achieve this is called the gospel. Please understand this. The gospel the gospel is first a message. It's a message that contains an information. That when that information is communicated, the spirit of God is mandated to back that information. That whoever receives that information as true, there is an advantage to receiving it. It's called the life of God. So the gospel is a revelation of the love of the Father. Please, let's follow this carefully. The gospel, what we call the gospel, the message of the gospel, is a revelation of the love of the Father demonstrated in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus, his son. And the object, the object of that sacrifice is the entire creation. Man first and then creation. I hope you know the gospel is not limited to man alone. The effect of the gospel must be seen all across creation. So the first of our corporate mandate is to see to it that through the instrument of the gospel, the message that saves, that every single man upon this earth will come to a point where there would be recipients of the life of God by acknowledging the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ as proof 
that God loved man. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. John chapter 3 and verse 16. He so loved the world and demonstrated that love by giving Jesus his only begotten. But now he's not the only begotten. Today he's the first of we the begotten. But at that time he was the only begotten of the Father. Are we together now? He sacrificed Jesus and by the shedding of blood, the humiliation of the cross, his death and burial and resurrection, today we have access to the life of God. And the Bible says, whosoever believes in him alongside everything that has been done. Listen, there is an exact information you have to believe about God to be saved. Not every information about God saves. Believing he's a prophet does not save. No. Believing God is kind does not save. Believing God is a good God does not save. In fact, believing God is God does not save. You will have to believe in the substitutionary sacrifice of his son to the end that men be saved. Are we together now? The Bible says there is no other name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. So this is very, very important. That means for as long as I am breathing, there is an expectation from God towards me that as I walk the length and the breadth of the earth, regardless my career, regardless my personal plan, regardless my pursuit, whatever it is, in the mind of God, you are only useful to him to the degree to which you are a contributor to this. If you are on earth today and your life is not directly helping for this to happen, as far as God is concerned, there is no justification for your continuity. Are we blessed? This is not a mandate to preach us. No. It is our, the first of our corporate mandate. That means the moment I wake up in the mind of God, someone has woken up and now there is a privilege given that men will be able to see the love of God again. They will be able to acknowledge Jesus again. And listen to me. <sighs> Dear Lord, how do I say this? There are many ways to evangelize and there are many ways to communicate. Are we together? And did you know that, I wish we had time to deal with this, in the Great Commission, man was given the assignment, go ye, he was given the jurisdiction, all the earth. He was given the message, preach the gospel. He was given those to talk to all creation, but he was never told how. The only part of the Great Commission that was left was the strategy. He created flexibility so that we can evolve. Are we together? That the assignment remains the same. The object remains the same. But the system can change. Today, you can stand somewhere trying to talk to someone and the person can say, this is, this is a crime. Maybe you are an armed robber or something. So that means that there has to be a lot of creativity and dynamism in our communicating the gospel. Are we together now? We live in very evil times when um, the way we used to do things as far as evangelism may need a lot of adjustment to be able to suit the reality of today's world. But it still does not mean God has bent his expectation. He still expects that there be joy every day in heaven because I woke up from my bed alive. And if my life is not sponsoring this, then I am a hindrance to the joy and the satisfaction of the Father's heart. Are we blessed? I'm trying to be as simple as possible. Establishing the Lordship of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind us that hell is real. I know that for many of us, it's been a long time you had this, but let me drum it. Hell is real. Someone woke up this morning and is now there as we speak. The Bible says it is appointed unto men to die once and after it the judgment. Believe me, when people die without Jesus Christ, they are going to hell. Regardless of how we try to convince ourselves, it is a reality. There are people who are going there. Some of them are our loved ones. And the Father's heart 
continues to bleed, where are the people who will arise and see to it that lives are changed, see to it that people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. We, unfortunately, the times that we live in now has not given us the allowance to really see the value of the salvation of a soul. But it is a miracle when someone is translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son. It does not look spectacular, but by that singular decision, a man's eternal destiny can be lived. Do you know that all of us are going to spend eternity? There's no such thing like, will you spend eternity? The issue is location. You will spend eternity. Are we blessed? Let me hurry because of time. Number two, the second dimension of our corporate mandate, and this is, this is the part that really concerns this conference. I just needed to establish the first part. The second part is, in, in, in summary, it's called kingdom advancement. But then the second dimension is establishing the lordship of Jesus Christ across every strata of human activities. That it is not enough to just see that souls or lives are saved. An individual can be saved, but a territory can be unsafe. And it will take extending the ideology of the gospel to institutionalize the value system of the kingdom across every strata of human activities. Failure to do that will endanger those who profess the name of the Lord and it will ultimately sabotage the purposes of God. Our commitment will not end uh, in seeing that Christ is established in the hearts of men alone. The territory must come under the influence of the value system of the kingdom. And the primary tool for achieving this is called dominion. Dominion. Dominion is a spiritual system by which we bring creation under the influence of the Christ and his value system. Remember the mandate is that let it be done in earth as it is in heaven. God is not the God of Christians, he's the God of all flesh. And the Bible and history has proven that everywhere the value system of the kingdom is respected and honored, that society becomes a reflection of heaven, regardless of the personal convictions of the individuals about the Christ. Every society today that we celebrate, their development, whether it is in the health sector, whether it is in technology, whether it is in the morality standard of that society, regardless of the individual persuasions they have about the person Christ, I can guarantee you that that society is working in that level of dexterity because they, the men there have allowed the value system of the kingdom to find expression. Regardless of the individual personal encounter with Jesus if our territories does not subscribe to the value system of the kingdom it, it will remain a place of danger and a place of decadence if you are together say amen, amen. influence what is influence influence is the ability to compel men to buy into your ideologies without using force or cruelty that you devise a mechanism through your results, through the dexterity of your life. Are we together now? That you substantiate your belief systems with a dimension of results that is so compelling, enough to cause people to change their ideology without using force, without using cruelty. Is called influence. This is the dimension of kingdom advance the church has neglected. We have done well in evangelism, commendably so. But we have ignored influence. And the times that we live in will require that believers attain a dimension of kingdom influence that will allow the value system of the kingdom to be both preserved and extended within a territory. Are we together? Hmm. So this is very, very, very important. I am a, a student of history sociologically speaking and even from the bible 
and I've studied revivals and I've studied the moves of God and I've studied the socioeconomic impact of the gospel across different territories through many centuries. I have found out that every time evangelism was used as the only tool, there was a side effect to the growth of those people. You would find out that they would do well in terms of their personal spiritual growth, but there will be systems that create subjugation of the saints. Are we together now? Yes. That kingdom advance through the gospel is twofold. Number one is the message that saves. Number two is the ideology that creates dominion. It is this twofold operation that makes the saints to be comfortable to serve God and then the territory to be civil enough to allow humans to behave like the zenith of God's creation. Every time you see crime, every time you see decadence, the, 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 the destruction that befalls nations, sadly including Africa, is not necessarily a product of a limitation in evangelism. It is that the other side that has been neglected for years, we are now beginning to pay the price. So we have individuals who can die for Jesus. We have individuals who love Jesus passionately, but we have a territory that is outspokenly rejecting the value system of the kingdom. This conference is an attempt to bring the restoration of that other side. Are we together? Yes. And I can tell you where this started from. When you study through church history, you will find out that there was a period in the church where believers were greatly persecuted under emperors like Nero. Sometimes they would not even last 72 hours. If you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you knew that you would almost, you would be dead in in days are we together now so over a long period of time under that harsh climate of persecution most believers did not think of things like productivity creativity because their ultimate concern was martyrdom now under emperor constantine and under certain conditions believers were now allowed the liberty to express themselves and they did not know what else to do with their lives because they had been through seasons of of martyrdom are we together now and so many of them considered carnal and unspiritual to participate in socioeconomic activities and it began to advance an ideology that makes believers to not participate in socioeconomic activities. And sadly speaking, we are still victims of that thinking till today. So the scope, and, and I want to say this respectfully, I know that there are people online following. Um, this is the reason why it is important I say this respectfully, even to preachers, we must be enlightened enough to understand the scope of our spiritual communication because the church is a platform for mentorship. People become a reflection of the ideology of their leaders. Are we together? The narrative that limits the relevance of a believer to just evangelism and salvation while allowing creation to... to knows dive the bible calls us the light of the world that means the definition of darkness is the world without the church hello scriptures exhort us from the book of proverbs it says my son attend to my sins incline thy ears to my words let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee as you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well. That you will keep these words in the midst of your heart. That no matter the circumstance, your eyes are going to be fixed on these words. And as you have been blessed, we will tell you to share this message. Be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed. And then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos. We have loads of content that is going to make you blessed. That is going to set you on course. That is going to set you ablaze. And don't forget to like for us. Thank you.